Good evening, and uh, thank you all for uh, being here with us tonight as one more event in the day of uh, our public interest lawyer in residence. Many of you have had an opportunity to hear from Mr. Rapping starting at, now I was going to say 9 o'clock this morning, but that's not true because uh, he surprised us and came last night while some people were uh, watching a movie about his organization. He has been uh, incredibly generous with his time. You'll hear more about him and his organization in a minute. But uh, I want to thank you all for being a part of a very special day and a half here at Toro. And this is my first time uh, experiencing the public interest lawyer in residence program. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Peter Davis and Professor Richie Klein and Dean Howard Glickstein for uh, pulling this program together this year and uh, making sure that we remind ourselves of why we're at Toro Law School. So with that, I'd like to turn the program over to Professor Richie Klein, who is going to give a formal introduction of Mr. Rapping. Well, one thing I just want to say is sort of the, about the great timing of Jonathan Rapping being here. It's just a couple of weeks almost that we, uh, since we have approved the issuance of a certificate in the study of criminal law for students who emphasize criminal law courses during their years here, and they'll graduate not just with a JD degree, but also with a certificate in the study of criminal law. And this, for this semester alone, we've offered four new courses in criminal law. We have a course in environmental law, in cyber law, in um, criminal trial practice, and in professional responsibility, criminal ethics. So it really is a time when we're emphasizing all the more the study of criminal law and criminal justice. And it is an absolute delight to have someone who's a hero for many of us in the criminal justice system. Jonathan Rapping started working right after law school for 10 years at the Public Defender Service in Washington, DC, which is certainly one of the top uh, defender organizations in the country. After 10 years, he went to Georgia to direct their training program for public defenders. Then he instituted the Southern Public Defender Training Center, which now is referred to as Gideon's Promise. Um, some of the things that he said today, and he talked to my criminal law class as well as to a lunch of the faculty, just sort of have hit me in, in, in such a hard way because they're just so moving and they're such truths. And one of the comments that he made, this was during the criminal law class at lunch, was that some of the people he knows who are most fulfilled with their lives are lawyers. And some of the people that he knows who were the least fulfilled with their lives are lawyers. And that was, in part, his making the point how terribly important it is for people to have work and to do work. That really means um, a lot to them. And certainly, Jonathan Rapping, who's devoted his life to the cause, to the really very difficult struggle to fight for quality, effective assistance for the poorest of the people in this country and those who sort of so rarely get a shot um, at anything. And Jonathan Rapping has been struggling to get more resources at the time when governments at all levels are cutting back in funding for this most important kind of work. Um, the right to an effective assistance of counsel is absolutely basic. It's basic to people having their Fourth Amendment right. You're not going to have a protection against an illegal search if you don't have an effective counsel who's going to be arguing that the search was illegal. You're not going to have a protection against a suggestive lineup procedure unless you have that effective counsel. You can be sentenced to what constitutes cruel and unusual punishment because the sentence is so excessive without the effective counsel. Um, there can be false testimony unless you have an effective counsel who's done all the work necessary to cross-examine some witnesses who might be lying. You're not going to be protected against that fabricated testimony. And I really do think that it's the criminal defense lawyer, in part, who's most involved with the enforcement of our Constitution on a very basic day-to-day -day level. It's the criminal defense lawyer who's fighting for the constitutional rights of, to some extent, those people who simply need it the most. 
the preamble to the model rules of professional conduct. The very first part of the preamble of these model rules states that lawyers have a special responsibility regarding the quality of justice. And I'm absolutely delighted and honored to um, welcome someone who's just devoted his life um, to that fight for the quality of justice. So. Well, thank you. It really is quite an honor to be here, uh, not just with you tonight, but to have been able to spend the day with so many of you and to look forward to spending tomorrow, at least half of tomorrow, with some of you. You know, I can say honestly that I have never had a day since I've become a lawyer where I didn't wake up feeling like I love my job. Right? There are days that it was hard. There were days that maybe I wanted a break, but there was never a day that I second-guessed, uh, that I second-guessed whether being a lawyer was the right job. There were days I questioned whether being a public defender was the right job, as I'm going to talk about it, but never a day that I questioned whether sort of being a lawyer and doing what I think is right was the, was the right job. But, but I'll tell you, my journey, uh, spending some time with uh, with you students has really caused me to think back to uh, when I was in your shoes, right? When I was a law student. And I think about when I was a law student and why I wanted to get into public defender work. And at the time, it was really about a deep appreciation for some very lofty ideals, right? Due process, equal protection, safeguarding the individual against the tyrannical power of the government, right? Those were reasons that I wanted to become a public defender. And then I became a public defender. And I learned that's not at all why I do the work. I, I learned that I do the work because it's about people, right? It's about people. And the first time I sort of learned that lesson was the very first case I ever had. I was a young public defender right out of law school. I had just done six weeks of training, got my first client, and my first client was a young man, 15 years old, who was accused of murder. He and his best friend, another 15-year-old, were home playing with a gun that they found in the house when the gun accidentally went off, killing his best friend. And this was my first case. And as I walked into court and I was handed my first file, I went back into lockup to meet my new client. And what I found when I went back there was a young man who was really absolutely comatose. Uh, he was just in shock, grief-stricken over the role he played in the death of his best friend. He couldn't even communicate. I went on to represent that young man, and over time we developed a, a, a very good relationship. I came to care about him deeply, like him very much, and desperately want to help him out of this situation. And we went to trial. It was a bench trial before a judge. He was three days shy of his 16th birthday, literally three days shy of being charged as an adult. But he was in juvenile court, so we had a bench trial. And after that trial, the judge found this young man guilty of manslaughter. And I remember the feeling when the judge led, or the, 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 the court marshals led this young man back to lockup to be taken to Oak Hill, which was a hell hole in DC where they housed juveniles. He was sentenced to juvenile life, which means he'd be held there until he was 21 years old. And as he got let out the back and I walked out the front, I remember walking across the street to my office, going into my office, closing the door, turning out the lights, sitting down in my chair, and I literally cried. Right? I cried and I thought to myself, you know what, maybe I made a mistake. Right? Maybe being a public defender isn't the right job for me. Right? This job is just too hard. It's just too hard watching terrible things happen to people we come to care about so deeply. And I really did think about using my talents elsewhere. But I was in an office where I was surrounded by a really strong community of advocates who propped me up, who helped me understand that we can't always save our clients from having bad things happen to them, that there's value in simply standing up for someone who otherwise would have no one to stand up for them. And so I carried on, obviously. I continued being a public defender. Uh, and I went on doing that work for several years. And then about six years later, I had the next 
sort of formative experience that I really remember. At this time, I was a supervisor at the DC Public Defender Service. Uh, by now, I had handled all kinds of cases. I represented people charged with rapes, with murders. Uh, and on this one occasion, I walked into my office, and there was a file sitting on my desk, and a note on the file. And the note said, rap. That's what everyone calls me. You all should call me rap. It said, rap. Meet your new client. Go to the jail and meet your new client. And I opened this file, and there was a police report. And as I read the police report, I read about what to date was the most horrendous crime I'd been involved in. And as I said, I'd represented people charged with rapes and murders. But, but as I read this police report, I learned that this man was accused of committing a series of very violent sexual assaults. And the allegations right, were that he raped a series of women, leaving them very, very terribly injured, both physically and psychologically. And as I read the report, I learned that not only were the allegations egregious, but the evidence was overwhelming. There was DNA found in the van that he owned from all of these women. There were hairs and fibers from the women's bodies and clothing found in the van. There were fibers from the van found in the apartments where each of these women lived. All of these women identified my client pursuant to either lineups or photo arrays. They all identified this incredibly unique looking van that was registered to my client. And to top it off, there was a statement. And while my client never said that he committed these terrible crimes, he did tell the police that he had been driving his van, that van, in the relevant neighborhoods on the relevant dates at the relevant times. And I remember as I got ready to go to the jail, I thought to myself, who am I about to meet? You see, for six years, I represented people charged with all kinds of crimes. And what I came to understand, right, what I came to understand is that while it's easy for us to label people based on the worst five minutes of their life, it's easy for us to label people robbers or burglars or rapists or murderers. No one is the sum total of the worst five minutes of their life. I represented mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and sons daughters, fry cooks, janitors. I had a quote that I kept on my wall, and I'm a quote fan, so my office wall is filled with quotes. And when I was a young public defender, that's what I'd draw inspiration from. I'd look up on my wall when it was 11 o'clock at night and I was working, and I'd look to a quote. And there was one quote in particular that I loved uh, by Sister Helen Prejean. And the quote is, the dignity of the human spirit is that no person is as bad as the worst thing they've ever done. And I knew that. I'd represented people who surely had done some bad things, but they were so much more than that. But yet, despite the fact that I knew that, as I, as I got ready to go to the jail, I wondered, is this going to be the first person I can't find something human about? So I went to the jail, and I walked into the visiting room, and I sat down across from my new client, and I proceeded to develop a relationship with someone who to this day is one of the kindest, caring people I'd ever met. When I sat down with him, he never asked about himself. He asked me how these women were doing, these victims. He wanted to know how they were. He asked about his family that he was incredibly concerned about. And then I met his family and I understood where he got this very kind side from. I met his mother. I met his three sisters. I met his wife. And I met his two little children who just loved their daddy so much. And they were all so sweet. And I knew that's where he got this side of him. And as we prepared for trial, and there was no plea offer, so there was clearly going to be a trial, I was terrified. And I was terrified because not only did I have this man's life in my hands, Right? I had this family. I had these people who cared about him depending on me. And we went to trial, and the trial lasted about three weeks. And the jury went out, and they were out for a day, two days, three, and I started getting optimistic. Four days. And then the jury came back. And I remember standing there with my client, Mr. Jones, and the jury, jury four-person stood up to announce the verdict, and the jury, jury four-person four said, we the jury find Mr. Jones guilty 
of each and every count. The judge sentenced Mr. Jones to 85 years to life. He was 40 at the time. He literally will never see the streets again. And I remember walking out of that courtroom having that feeling that I had six years earlier, right? Maybe I'm in the wrong profession. This job is just too hard. It's too hard seeing terrible things happen to people you come to care about so deeply. But I had to steel myself to go to the jail and visit Mr. Jones. And that evening, I did go to the jail. And I walked into the visiting room. And I approached Mr. Jones, and I said, Mr. Jones, I am so sorry. And he said to me, Mr. Rapping, I want to thank you. And I said, thank me? Maybe you didn't understand what happened today, but things didn't go so well. And he said, no, you don't understand. He said, I was born and raised in Washington, D.C., and I've been in institutions in D.C. my whole life. I went to D.C. public schools. I never had a teacher who cared about me. I was in the juvenile justice system. When I was a kid and, and I got in trouble, I was in the juvenile justice system. I never had a lawyer who cared about me. I was in the adult system. I was on probation for a drug offense when you met me. My lawyer in that case never came to visit me. But you and your law clerks and your investigators, you treated me with dignity. You treated me with respect. You gave me the kind of representation that I deserve, finally. And to be honest with you, I could easily spend the rest of my life in prison as long as my family doesn't think I committed these terrible crimes. And they sat in that courtroom and they are absolutely convinced the jury got it wrong. So for that, I thank you. And I went home that night and I had an epiphany. Right? I realized for the first time that being successful as a public defender is not about winning every case. It's about being able to look in the mirror every day and say, you have given each and every client the kind of representation they deserve, the kind of representation our Constitution entitles them to, the kind of representation that in courtrooms across this country we pay lip service to daily. And if you can do that, you're successful as a public defender. But I took another real lesson from Mr. Jones. What Mr. Jones was saying to me was you're the first person to see me as a human being. Right? He was just another client in a system that stopped seeing him as a human being. And when you stop seeing someone as a human being, it becomes easy to process them. It becomes easy to discard them. And so he was thanking me for that. The stories I, I, I like to tell are not about innocent people. I think those are important stories, but I don't think they're ambitious enough. Because our system insists that we give dignity and representation to people regardless of whether they've done something bad or not. As lawyers, we have to remember that. So for 10 years, I worked in an office where I could say that each and every day I was able to give every client what they deserve. Right? That was my standard of success for a public defender for the rest of my time at the DC Public Defender Service. And then I got an offer to move to Georgia, to become the training director for a statewide public defender system in Georgia. And I realized right, that I was working with young, passionate, energetic public defenders who no matter how hard they tried, no matter how many hours they worked, they would never be able to look in the mirror and say they've given each and every client everything they deserved. The caseloads were too high, the resources didn't exist, and I had to develop a new benchmark for what it means to be successful as a public defender. As I moved to Georgia, I started to learn about the quality of justice that poor people get in most of this country. I learned about Carlos Ivey from Union County, Mississippi, who at the age of 14 was accused of taking $100 from a woman. He insisted he was innocent. He went to jail, sat in jail. His court-appointed lawyer never came to see him. Eleven months went by before his court-appointed lawyer came to visit him. 
And when he did, his court-appointed lawyer said to him on the eve of trial, I've got a plea offer that will have you out in six years. And Carlos, with nowhere to turn, said, but I'm innocent. And the lawyer said, you can say that if you want to at trial, but you're looking at a lot of time. And young Carlos, not having an advocate, took that plea. But his lawyer was wrong. He didn't get six years. He got 25 years, 10 to serve. I learned about Curtis Osborne. I talked to you, some of you today about Curtis Osborne, who was executed June 5th, 2008 in Georgia. He was given a court-appointed lawyer who had the contract in Spalding County, Georgia, to handle every felony. There were some years that he would handle as many as 900 cases. And that was his part-time job because he also took retained cases to help pad his salary. And he represented Curtis Osborne on a capital murder. Curtis Osborne was convicted. He was executed. And after he was executed, it came out that his lawyer told another client, I had a plea offer that would have spared Mr. Osborne's life, but I didn't give it to him because in my mind, that little end deserved to die. That was his advocate. And then I went to New Orleans. And when I went to New Orleans, it was the most shocking thing I'd ever seen. I walked into a courtroom in New Orleans for the first time, and it was just pure chaos. There were people in suits everywhere. You didn't know who the defenders were. You didn't know who the prosecutors were. You knew who the judge was. He was in the robe up on the bench. You knew who the accused were because they were in orange jumpsuits shackled along the side. And the judge started calling cases, and the processing began. And the judge would call a name, and a voice would come up from the suits, and you didn't know what suit the voice was attached to. But no one in a suit ever stood next to anyone in a jumpsuit. And about 10 seconds later, the judge would call another name, and it went on like this, the processing, until the judge called a name and there was no voice. And the judge turned to the orange jumpsuits and said, is Mr. So-and-so here? And a man stood up. And the judge said, where's your lawyer? And the man said, I haven't seen a lawyer since I got locked up. And the judge said, how long have you been locked up? The man said, 70 days. The judge said, thank you, sir, sit down, and went on with the processing. And what was more shocking to me than the fact that a man had been locked up for 70 days without a lawyer was that no one in that courtroom was phased. Not the judge, not the prosecutors, not the defense attorneys. See, they had become accustomed to that quality of justice for poor people. And it was then that I got the idea to start this organization, Gideon's Promise. Right? And the idea behind Gideon's Promise was to develop a community, a generation of public defenders who understand what their clients deserve, who have some tools to try to give their clients what they deserve, and who have some strategies to resist, to resist the pressures to process people. And for those lawyers to go into courtrooms across the region and push the systems to live up to their highest ideals. And that was the start of Gideon's promise. But really, in essence, I think what our lawyers do more than anything else is they simply work every day to inject a little bit of humanity into a system that's lost its humanity. And if you think about our criminal justice system, we have always been a system that has defined some as the other. Some as the outsider, some as the them. And when you define a group of people as the them, it becomes easy to do horrific things to them. Go back in time 100 years, where I live, in Georgia, in that part of the country. Think about what justice was for people who come from the communities that so many public defenders in the South represent. Right? It was an accusation, a tree, a noose. You couldn't do that to other human beings unless you stopped seeing them as human beings. Right? Up until the middle part of the 20th century, chain gangs. You couldn't do that to other people unless you stopped seeing them as human beings. Today in Arizona, Sheriff Joe Arpaio dresses inmates in pink underwear to humiliate them, to strip them of any shred of humanity they have left. And people vote for this sheriff. You couldn't do that unless you lost sight of the humanity of these people.
2.3 million people behind bars in cages, small, six by six cells. Violent, dangerous. You know, there was a strike at Pelican Bay, a hunger strike at Pelican Bay prison this summer where inmates there refused to eat. They would rather die than be subjected to the conditions that we forced on them. We couldn't do that to people unless we lost sight of their humanity. And I know there's a class here tonight, Professor Kaufman's class, right, on civil liberties during a time of terror. And it's appropriate that you're here because in this time of terror, right, we've created a whole new world of other. There's a whole new group of people that we have no compunction about depriving of their civil liberties. And the only people who are going to stop that from happening are lawyers. If you think about some of the more egregious examples of what uncaring lawyers can do, you understand how badly we need caring lawyers. The case of Cameron Todd Willingham, who was accused of setting fire to his home in Corsicana, Texas, and killing his three young children. He was given a court-appointed lawyer, went to trial, and the primary evidence against him was a forensic scientist, an arson expert, who claimed clearly the cause of the fire was an arson. Cameron Todd Willingham was executed. Subsequently, experts reviewed that case, and national experts came to the opposite conclusion. In fact, not only was it not an arson, it was an accident. It seemed pretty clear that Texas had executed an innocent man, but there were defenders of what happened to Cameron Todd Willingham. Among them, his own lawyer. This is what his lawyer had to say on Anderson Cooper. There were no grounds for reversal. And the verdict was absolutely the right one. Shoot, it's incredible that anyone's even thinking about it. And when asked about the other people he represents, this is what he had to say. Most of the time, they're guilty of sin. Imagine being appointed a lawyer who feels that way about you before you've had your day in court. And it's not just the South. Go north to Michigan, the case of Eddie Joe Lloyd. Eddie Joe Lloyd was accused of raping, kidnapping, and murdering a young girl on her way to school. He was given a court-appointed lawyer who didn't do anything in his case and withdrew six days before trial. His replacement lawyer never asked for a continuance, never did any pre-trial investigation or filed any motions. Eddie Joe Lloyd went to trial six days after getting his new lawyer and was convicted, and he was appointed an appellate lawyer. His appellate lawyer would not go to visit Eddie Joe Lloyd, and in fact wouldn't even accept his collect phone calls. He filed the appeal, which unsurprisingly was denied, and then Eddie Joe Lloyd got post-conviction counsel. And his post-conviction counsel alleged, among other things, that his appellate lawyer was ineffective. When asked about that, this is what his appellate lawyer had to say about his own client. This is a sick individual who raped, kidnapped, and strangled a young woman on her way to school. His claim of my wrongdoing is frivolous, just as is his existence, both should be terminated. That's his champion. Eddie Joe Lloyd is now one of the over 300 people exonerated by DNA in this country. I've been saying all day long, and I say it everywhere I go, this is a civil rights issue. What's happening in our criminal justice system is happening overwhelmingly to poor people, disproportionately to people of color. The greatest abuse is happening to minorities. Poor people, people of color are happening in our criminal justice system. And it's going to take a civil rights movement to change that. I work with a group of lawyers who struggle against overwhelming odds to change that. And the most common phone call I get is from the young lawyer who says, Rap, I think I need to quit. I think I need to quit because I've been to Gideon's Promise. I understand what my clients deserve, and I can't give it to them. I feel defeated. And I always share with them the takeaway from a wonderful book I read called Freedom Summer, written by a man named Bruce Watson. 
And Bruce Watson writes this book about Freedom Summer, that summer project in 1964, where young people, younger than you from all around the country, went to Mississippi to join forces with SNCC workers, civil rights workers in Mississippi, to register people to vote, to build freedom schools, to educate people to pass uh, uh, literacy tests. And he tells the story through their own words because he interviews them. And what you learn through this book is that these young people went down there thinking they could change the world and their families told them, you're wasting your time. And they went down there eager and energetic and then they started getting doors slammed on their faces. And people would say, don't come near me, the church down the street was bombed. And so they started getting discouraged. And you could tell through the interviews, they start wondering as the summer goes on whether they're wasting their time, whether they're making a difference. And Bruce Watson fast forwards 40 years to an interview with Congressman John Lewis. And Congressman Lewis says, you know, if it weren't for Freedom Summer, Barack Obama would not be in the White House. And regardless of your politics, it is a milestone to have an African American in the White House. I don't know that anyone in 1963 would have envisioned that happening in their lifetime. These young people changed the world and change was so incremental they couldn't see it while it was going on. And I say to our lawyers, every day you go into court and you stand up and you say this isn't right. You say if anyone in the courtroom is gonna, is gonna stand up and say I'm not taking it, it will be me. You're changing the world incrementally. Right, I was sharing with Professor Klein's class earlier today, a snippet from one of my favorite documentaries, The Jewish Americans. And in that documentary, they interview a rabbi named Rabbi uh, Rachel Cowan. In The Jewish Americans, it's about the Jewish experience in America, but there's a segment in there about the Jewish experience with the civil rights movement. And Rabbi Cowan was one of those young people training to go to Freedom Summer on June 21st, 1964, when word came up to Ohio that three civil rights workers, Schwerner, Goodman, and Cheney, two Jewish, one African-American, disappeared. We now know later that summer they were found murdered. And the, 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 the people who ran the training camp said to these young folks, we can't guarantee your safety. If you don't want to get on the bus, you don't have to get on the bus. And Rabbi Cowan called her mother and said, Mom, what should I do? And her mom said, baby, don't get on that bus. She said, but mom, 20 years ago, our family, members of our family perished in the Holocaust. And if some of those Germans had just gotten on that bus, maybe they'd be here today. And she got on the bus. She signed her will, and she got on the bus. Right? And throughout our history, young people have joined movements to address challenges. Right? You don't have to do it as a criminal defense lawyer. Right? There was a time in this country when young children work 16-hour days and lose limbs, and lawyers helped right, change the, the, the child labor laws. So we can't do that anymore. There are plenty of problems in our society that we need lawyers to help fix, problems like homelessness, right? problems like health care, problems like immigration reform. Right? There's a place for lawyers. There's a need. For lawyers, I want to share with you this is my favorite piece of artwork. And it's, a, it's, it's a, a, a painting by a man named Frank Wu. And it's just titled Indifference. And it's these mechanical legs just walking by a homeless veteran curled up in a fetal position. Right? And we all look at that and we understand it. It, it, it tells us that all of us, every day, we walk past, past so much misery, so much poverty, that we begin to get desensitized to it. The other day I was walking down the street with my two children, five and nine, and we walked past a homeless man who said, can you spare some, can you spare some change? And I just kept walking and my daughter tugged on my sh shoulder and said, Daddy, doesn't he need your change more than you? And it's a reminder, right, that we lose that sensitivity that we, that we bring into this world. And I love that because as lawyers, we walk into courtrooms every day, and if we're paying attention, we will see lawyers doing this every day, ignoring, becoming desensitized to injustices in the criminal justice system. Maybe it's not the same as Cameron Todd Willingham's lawyer or Eddie Joe Lloyd's. It's subtle things, like maybe not filing that motion because you don't want to anger the judge. Maybe not fighting as hard as you could fight. And it's subtle. 
but it begins to build. And the words that go with that painting are when we walk past the homeless person ignoring them, we lose a little bit of our humanity. And as lawyers, you can't afford to lose your humanity. As lawyers, you're going to come across people reaching out for help, and you're going to have to decide. Are you going to grab that hand, or are you going to walk past it? Are you going to refuse to even put yourself in a position where you see it? Right? Those are choices that we make as lawyers every day. I want to wrap up by just acknowledging this is the 50th anniversary of Gideon versus Wainwright. I think one of the greatest criminal procedure cases in history. I think it's appropriate that it's also the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington because Gideon versus Wainwright is a civil rights case. It's a case that says we can't have equal justice if we don't give poor people the same kind of lawyers that you and I would want for our loved ones. We can't realize Dr. King's dream if we're not providing equal justice in the criminal justice system. So it's appropriate that the 50th anniversary of both these events occur in the same year. Does anyone know who those four, any, any students know who those four little girls are? Those are the four little girls who lost their lives also 50 years ago last month in the 16th Street church bombing in Birmingham, Alabama. Right? Those are the costs of indifference. Those are the costs of being able to look at another community as something less than human. Five years after the March on Washington, the Memphis sanitation workers went on strike with a very simple sign, right? I am a man. Yelling to the world, I'm a man. That's all I want you to do is recognize I'm a human being. Right? How can people have to stand up and ask the world to acknowledge their humanity? Sadly, right? For some people, they still need signs that just remind our justice system. I am a man. I'm a woman. I'm a person. So I'd ask you to do this. When you go out in the world, right, you are going to confront pressures to join in on the dehumanizing. Don't do it. It's a great quote from Elie Wiesel. There may be times when we're powerless to prevent injustice, but there must never be a time when we fail to protest. As lawyers, your success doesn't come from changing an unjust system. It comes from protesting against it. And all of you have the power to do that. The Talmud. I'm going to end with a story from the Talmud. It's one of my favorite stories about a wise old man who went to Sodom preaching against greed and indifference and suffering. And at first, people listened. Right? They were eager to hear. And after a while, as he went on preaching, people lost interest. Thieves went on thieving. Murderers went on murdering. People tuned him out. Sometimes they snickered. But he went on preaching. And one day a young child came up to him and said, Old man, you walk the streets night and day, yelling and screaming, thinking you can change the world. Can't you, say, can't you see it's hopeless? And the old man said, Child, I know I'm not going to change the world. If at first, when I came here, my ye I started yelling and screaming. It was because I did think I could change the world. But if I persist, if I can continue to yell, if I continue to scream, it's no longer because I think I can change the world. It's to keep the world from changing me. Right? When you go out there in the world, don't let it change you. It is such an honor to be here with you. I am grateful to the law school for inviting me to have this opportunity. And I look forward to seeing you over the next 12 hours before I have to leave. Thank you. Oh, sure, sure.
I'm, take, I'm taking the names of those of you who aren't standing, you know. All right, we have some time for some questions. Um, let me just start, perhaps, and ask you to make some comments about the role of the prosecutors that you see in all of yeah. this. And there are a lot of students who are interested in becoming prosecutors. What message would you have um, for them? I, I mean, I really do think, well, I guess I'll come up here and say, I, I, look, I really think the message is the same. I think you have to be aware of what justice is. And as prosecutors, you are also going to face pressures, just like the defenders I described, pressures to secure convictions. Right? In many offices, success of the prosecutor depends on securing convictions. Right? If you don't really understand your obligations to justice, to disclose exculpatory information, to help ferret out constitutional violations, right? it becomes easy in a in a, in a fervor to win cases, to earn convictions, it becomes easy to start taking shortcuts. And then you are actually contributing to injustice as opposed to combating it. One thing I say to my students who want to be prosecutors, what are you going to do when you're in a courtroom and you see a defense attorney who clearly isn't living up to his constitutional obligations to his client? As a minister of justice, is it your job to take advantage of that? Or is it your job to speak up and make sure that person gets the representation that they deserve? So I think for prosecutors, I think you too, you may have a harder job because I think there is a real culture in many prosecutors' offices uh, that is a, a, a culture of win at all costs. I was at a breakfast this morning with a group of students, and one was telling me about her experience in a DA's office. And she recognized this as a brand new uh, uh, intern. As a matter of fact, I wonder if the people who had been there for a while stopped recognizing it because they became desensitized. But she said that she was sort of taken aback when she saw that people talked about human beings as bodies. How many bodies are we, are we bringing in today? How many bodies have you convicted? When you start talking about people as bodies, Right? Stop and give yourself a reality check. Is that really the person you want to become? And so I think when you are in a prosecutor's office and you hear that, right, you can do your job. You can work your butt off to prove your case beyond a reasonable doubt, but say, I'm sorry. I just don't want to participate in referring to people as bodies. I think this is Mr. Jones, and let's talk about the evidence we have against Mr. Jones. And it takes courage. But without courage, we're not going to change anything. In the green? So this is a, we could have a whole class on this. We could have a whole, a whole semester on this. But, but, but the short answer is this, right? I assume your rules of professional responsibility mirror the, the, the model rules, and there's a rule, 3.3, 3, that, that requires that you, uh, that, that you act with candor towards the tribunal. You can't lie, right? But you also, under Rule 1.6, cannot divulge to anyone anything you've learned from your client. And you have an obligation to represent them right, as zealously as you can. And so you have a represent, uh, uh, an obligation to point out every hole in the state's case. Right? If there is evidence right, that you do not know to be untrue that suggests a defense theory, you have to consider that and decide whether that's the best way to go. But you've got to very zealously represent this person and argue all the reasonable inferences from the admissible evidence. And to do anything else, what I would say is this. To me, the easier answer is, what, can't, what can you not do? And I think what you cannot do is decide because your client confided in you as we want people to do, as the rules are meant to encourage people to do, you are going to hold it against them and represent them any less zealously. And if you get to that point, you're conflicted, and you probably need to move to withdraw from the case. So I, I don't see that as a conflict at all, other than if your client wants to testify, and then you have to look to your rules to see what your obligation is with respect to a client who you know to be lying versus reasonably believe to be lying, and that's a complicated discussion.
is innocent? No, I, I, because I really do believe that we have a system that is designed to give everyone the same quality of representation. If the lawyer takes it upon himself or herself to make his or her own assessment of whether someone's innocent or guilty and then allow that, that, that to determine how well they represent the person, they've really usurped the role of the jury, right? So I think that as a lawyer, you have to make sure you're giving every client uh, the same representation and not holding it against them because they decided to confide in you or because through your investigation, which you're constitutionally required to do, you learned information that might be harmful to them, right? Whatever information there is that is harmful to your client, it can't come from you. And I don't think it can affect the, the way you represent the client. Other than you have to make sure that you behave ethically, right? And, and again, you have to look at the rules and make sure you're not doing anything unethical in your zealous pursuit to represent your client. I'm sorry, we are recording this, so I'm just going to ask Mr. Rappin to repeat the question before he answers it. So, so, the, so the question is, does, does passion, zealous advocacy, skill, effectiveness, does that ever, do you think, cause prosecutors, does, does it impact the way they exercise their discretion in terms of going forward? I think absolutely. I think when you are a really good lawyer, and you prove that there is a price to be paid should a prosecutor take a case to trial, you're going to get better plea offers. I think that's true. I don't think, though, that's inducing anyone to do anything unethical. I think that's a prosecutor, right, judging the chances they have at prevailing at trial, and certainly who they're going up against is, is, is part of that assessment. I think the bigger problem is when the prosecutor says, I've got a lawyer who's ineffective, and let me take advantage of that. Right? That, to me, is where the ethical issue comes in for the prosecutor. Right? Uh, because again, I think they, they, have, they, they wear these two hats. They're an advocate. They're also a minister of justice. And those two things can conflict. You want to win, right? but you also have obligations to do things that make it harder for you to win. Well, so, so the question is, I, I talked about how uh, the criminal justice system can drive even the most passionate and effective people to lose a little bit of their humanity over time. And the question is, what about people maybe who go into the job already not seeing the people in the system as human? And there's no question in my mind that that does, does happen, and I'm not sure what we can do about those individuals, but it says to me it, it's that much more important that we get an army of people into those systems and into those courtrooms to inject some humanity into the courtroom. I mean, there will always be professionals you will talk to about the humanity of your client, and they just don't want to hear it. And they're never going to listen. And it certainly makes the job more difficult. Those are the times you go home and say, maybe I chose the wrong profession. This is just too hard. Right? But you carry on. And I think you continue to try to convince people right, of the greater humanity of the people you represent.
You know, when I, when I started as a public defender, our, oh yes, yeah, so the question was, there's a real stigma associated with representing people um, who are accused of bad things, and any public defender has dealt with, any defense attorney has dealt with the question, how can you represent those people and how do you answer it is generally the question. And, and when I started as a public defender, our trial chief used to have a button that said, don't tell my mother I'm a public defender, she thinks I play piano in the whorehouse, right? So, so that kind of gets at that point. But, but there, there is, uh, again, I have a lot of thoughts about this. There, there's a really a wonderful book that just came out, written by two, uh, two law professors, Monroe Friedman, uh, who's here at, I believe, Hofstra, and uh, Abby Smith, who's at Georgetown, called How Can You Represent Those People? And it's a series of essays by some really thoughtful defense lawyers, and I would, I would look at it. But one thing I was saying to Professor Klein's class today is in our training program, we teach this model that was developed by a training director in Kentucky, Jeff Shear, a really creative training director. And he has come up with this thing he calls the motivational triangle, all right? And let, let me do this quick game with you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say three quotes, and I want, you all to I, I want you to think about these three quotes, and then I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand, right? and vote for the quote that hits you in the gut the most, right? The one that just resonates with you the most. So the first, Sister Helen Prejean, the dignity of the human spirit is that no person is as bad as the worst thing they've ever done. The second, Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has. And number three, Nietzsche. <laughs> Distrust all in whom the impulse to punish is powerful. All right, so quick show of hands. Who would say the one that resonates with them the most is Sister Helen Prejean? The dignity of the human spirit is that no person is as bad as the worst thing they've ever done. All right, who would go with Margaret Mead? Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has. And who would go with Nietzsche? Distrust all in whom the impulse to punish is powerful. So I do that exercise with groups of public defenders all the time, and, and there always is sort of a, a split, a third. What Jeff would say is that every public defender comes to this job with one primary motivator, one of three primary motivators. There's the social worker. That's the person who really understands that their clients have never had a break in life. They've gone to broken schools. They've had drug-addicted parents. They've grown up in environments filled with violence, right? And they just want to make them whole. They want to try to help save people who have never had anyone in their corner. There's the warrior. That's the person who says, I'm offended by bullies. I don't like a government that's all-powerful coming against an individual and trying to strip them of their liberty. I want to stand up for that individual. And then there's the movement builder. The person who says, I believe in a better world, right? I think we can do better, and I want to be part of a community that is collectively working to realize that world. And Jeff would say, we're all motivated by one. And I, I'm going to suggest that based on your vote, you can probably predict which your primary motivator is, right? The sister Helen Prejean, what would your primary motivator be if that was your vote? Social worker. The Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. That's the movement builder. And Nietzsche, distrust all in whom the impulse to punish is powerful. The warrior, right? And so what Jeff would say is this. We all have a primary motivator. That primary motivator will, will not get us over every challenge. And the public defenders who survive the longest, the defense lawyers who survive the longest and sustain themselves, have been able to tap into all three and have been able to sort of move around. So if there's a client and you just can't feel the social worker, go to the warrior, go to the movement builder. And so when you ask, what would I say to people who say, how can you represent those people? I talk about each of those three really important values, seeing people as human beings, the understanding the importance of standing up to a government, right? Because as Rachel Cowan reminds us, when we don't, you get things like the Holocaust. And the movement builder, wanting to be part of a community to just improve a system that's dysfunctional. I'm just gonna ask, the, ask uh, the last question. I've heard you talk at lunch to the faculty, I've heard you talk to my criminal law students, I've heard you talk now, and you have never mentioned 
in all of these, in each of those three times, to judges. We talked about how prosecutors react if there's a lawyer who is ineffective and what the prosecutor's responsibility is. But what about all the judges in this whole criminal justice system that can be so unfair so often? So, I, you know, I, I, I think every professional bears responsibility, right? And I, I've seen judges who, quite frankly, I think the pressures that confront judges tend to be real pressure to move dockets, right? When prosecutors are bringing more cases than, than, than dockets can handle, there's a real pressure to move those dockets. I will, tell you, um, I will tell you a quick story about judges in Georgia. When Georgia uh, started its public defender system in 2005, 2004, got off the ground in 2005, uh, there was some real promise. And for two years, things were really going well. And then it started to get defunded. And now we've been backsliding in Georgia. And there's a little bit of a crisis. The funds aren't there, public defenders are overwhelmed, and there's been a lot of discussion about how we solve the public defender crisis. Well, there were two essays, two articles written by two different judges, right, that to me shows the worst of what can happen to a judge. One was written by a judge in Atlanta, and he said, if you want to solve the crisis, right, we need a little home cooking. You go find some starving young lawyers who will take any case for $50 a piece and let them practice their trade, okay? That is a pragmatic, practical solution that ensures we move the cases and ensures we don't have equal justice. Another letter by another judge said, what we ought to do is we ought to co-opt Every lawyer, force every lawyer to take pro bono a case. And that's how we'll solve the problem. We'll get real estate lawyers to take a criminal case. We'll get tax lawyers to take a criminal case. Right? Again, maybe a practical solution to the problem. But if I have money and I'm charged with a crime, I'm not hiring a tax lawyer. Right? And I'll tell you what, if you have problems with your taxes, don't come to me. So, so I think... Those are examples of how I think just like all of us, judges also can lose sight of justice when the systemic pressures are to move cases, to move dockets, right, to be efficient. Um, so, yeah, I didn't mean to let anyone off the hook or necessarily to put anyone on the hook, but just to speak to what I see as uh, as a crisis that shapes all of us, even those of us who are incredibly well-intentioned. And we just have to be conscious of it, or we'll end up being someone we don't recognize. So on behalf of all of us at Toro Law Center, I'd like to uh, once again Thank you, uh, Jonathan, for being here with us today. And I think as I was sitting here and listening again today, I kept thinking, you know, everything that we read in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times in the law papers, we're bombarded with this notion of somehow there's an oversupply of lawyers. And as I'm listening to this again today, I'm reminded that we have an undersupply of lawyers who are really committed to justice. And I think that uh, we are fortunate that uh, you are here to inspire us and to move us and again to remind us why we're here. And so on behalf of Toro, we have a, a tradition of giving our public interest lawyer in residence a nice bowl. And this says, Toro College, Jacob D. Fuchsberg Law Center, Distinguished Public Interest Lawyer in Residence, Jonathan Rapping, October 9th, 2013. I'll eat my Captain Crunch out of it. <laughs> thank you so much. No, thank you. thank you. Thank you all for coming. Oh, great. Thank you. It's in your the box there.